Sure. Yeah. Hello. Welcome to First Fridays, a series from Special Collections and University Archives here at University of North Carolina, Greensboro. This is a series of casual conversations with school archivists about um, interesting things in our collections. So today is a closer look at the Anno, Tercesimo, Tercio, Enrique, Octavi, which I originally thought was a libretto for an opera, but it is not. It is Frightening Laws enacted by King Henry VIII in 1541. So what, what is this book? It's a book and let's, uh, what is this book and why do we have it? Let's go to the next screen, there we go. So this book is a printed edition of all the parliamentary acts enacted by um, Parliament, there we go, and King Henry VIII in 18, I'm sorry, 1541. Now this particular copy was previously owned by a professor of law and psychiatry at UC Berkeley named Bernard Lee Diamond. And uh, this is of interest because he was um, a big expert witness in the trial night of Sirhan Sirhan who assassinated presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy in 1968. And the defense uh, team, you know, the defense case for Sirhan Sirhan was largely based on um, the, uh, basically, you know, this was the legal precedent from 1541 uh, that he was suffering from diminished capacity at the time he um, killed Kennedy and thus should not be put to death. Um, if found, if and when found guilty. So, uh, so yeah, so that's a bit of modern history with this book. So we're gonna, uh, I'm gonna ask a, quite the two questions to archivist Stacy Krim, and then we're gonna turn over to bonus content that was uh, discovered and of interest to our interim head of our department, Kathleen McCarty Smith. So Stacy. Why is this book significant and why did we purchase it? So this book's significance, at least at the time we were purchasing it, was because it has the first uh, English law enacting um, uh, against witchcraft. It was witchcraft treated as a felony under Henry VIII and punishable by not death. We do have courses that teach the history of witchcraft at UNCG. So uh, we purchase material regularly as part of supporting institutional instruction. We thought this would be a great uh, addition for our students to be able to handle and navigate as part of their research and learning in class learning. So that's why we ended up purchasing it. So I'm gonna share my screen to show you what the um, witchcraft law actually looks like in the volume. Um, and I know this is hard to read, so I'm going to show you also a uh, easier to read version of it. So the witchcraft law, which is technically a bill against conjuration and witchcraft and sorcery and enchantments, begins here and goes all through this page. And uh, really what it represents, much like almost everything under happening during Henry VIII, is consolidation of power. Um, as many of you are probably aware, uh, witchcraft trials were happening in continental Europe uh, during the 1400s. That gave a lot of power to the church. Um, and of course, Henry VIII at this point was uh, separating his power from the church. So he wanted to uh, make certain he was covering all of his bases, basis uh, in consolidating his, his kingly power against the church. This is a more modernized uh, version of the text that'll be a bit easier for you to read. Um, and what I want to show you to begin with is uh, thinking in terms we think, oh, wow, witchcraft laws, this is really cool. This is really important because we think of all of the things that have happened before with the, uh, the church in, in continental Europe, but also happening afterwards, even in the United States. So this is the entirety of the first witchcraft law in 1541, 
um, you see this paragraph and this is the entirety of what you were seeing on the previous uh, version. So this is witchcraft. This is the attention they were giving it to it. To it. This next chapter is devoted to laws relating to gaming. So all of this is about gaming. This is about gaming. This is about gaming. This is about gaming. And we get to here. So if you look at this as a textual base on a textual basis of where they're putting the most effort in nailing down these laws, the witchcraft law, the first one under Henry VIII, really wasn't um, as, perhaps uh, as important to him as other laws that were happening at the time. Henry VIII didn't seem to be as worried about metaphysics. Uh, as I was talking to Kathleen and, and Beth Ann earlier, his interests were much more secular and profane in, in terms of consolidating power. He didn't feel a great threat from witches. But talking about what makes this law unique, when you browse it, one of the first things you realize is it's talking a lot about negative magic. So it's talking about um, invoking or conjuring spirits. Um, so in, an invocation is um, a, a calling of the spirit to listen to you. Um, a conjuration would actually be having a spirit manifest to you. Uh, and then st specifically, this law was concerned with spirits that were going to do evil things on your behalf. Um, and that's an important distinction because um, it means that magic that was used for good isn't necessarily being made illegal according to this law. So it's not covering things like um, an amulet for protection, a talisman for uh, helping a woman be more fertile, uh, magic relating to health. So the king was mainly concerned with uh, magic that could be used for evil purposes, which makes sense because if witchcraft was going to be weaponized, there would be no real way of protecting the crown from the, the, that magic. Um, as you also read, you'll notice there's a lot of attention paid to uh, people who use magic to find lost treasure. Uh, this was apparently a very heavy area of fraud happening in England. People who would say, if you pay me this much, I will help you find lost treasure on this land. And then people would go um, digging it up based on these recommendations. So that was probably the most critical thing they were trying to protect against. And also, if you look towards the end, you will notice if someone was actually convicted of witchcraft, all their properties would be forfeited to the crown, and this included clergy. So again, he's, he's wield, creating the ability to wield power within the church. Um, when this was created, this law was considered to be very harsh um, because in English common law, you had to have a lot of evidence in a case that was going to um, be an ex a case you would get executed in if you were found guilty. And it's hard to get evidence in a witchcraft trial. So that is uh, one characteristic of, a characteristic of it that is unique. During the uh, time this law was enacted, which was from 1541 to 1546. It was uh, repealed by Edward after Henry VIII died. No one, or at least historians are not aware of anyone having this law used against them. So no one died under this particular law or was executed. Um, so we don't have a lot of information um, relating to how the trials played out relating to this. But after Edward, Elizabeth did reenact witchcraft laws in 1563. And that's where things start picking up on the uh, witchcraft documentation. So this website, I'm gonna put it in chat. It's really cool. It's actually a teaching website created by the UK National Archives that has some primary sources um, in, in it. Um, witchcraft in England, the largest number of people executed actually was under Elizabeth I. Um, and she had two separate uh, witchcraft related laws. The first one, which was against conjuration, um, similar to Henry VIII's law in 1563. And then she also had one about um, 
uh, seditious words and rumors about the queen because uh, of prophets, prophets prophesizing about her death or something she was doing. Um, of course, James I, after Elizabeth, famously uh, took up witchcraft once again, but actually uh, executions and convictions decreased under James I, because although he was very fanatical about witchcraft and especially demonology, he actually wrote a book about it. Um, he was more interested in uh, distinctions between false cases and real cases of demonology. And under King James' reign, torture being used to elicit confession was actually made illegal. Um, so that uh, also caused, <laughs> as you can imagine, uh, convictions to go down. These are really fun documents. Um, if you look through them, as I said, none of them actually date to the Henry VIII law. These are going to be uh, Elizabeth, James, and after. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when you have like the pretending to be a witch uh, documentation, that's actually under James because he was very concerned about making certain those were uh, identifying real cases. Um, what I really enjoy about this website, other than you can easily navigate um, the, the documentation and it has uh, a professor talking about the material. It also has a transcript. Uh, so you can read read it more easily. Um, and this is uh, this is one of my favorite ones because I have a lot of questions about it. This is a group of men in a village coming together to say this woman is not in fact a witch, though she is a woman of loose life. And uh, I have questions about um, why these men might, might not have wanted her to be interrogated <laughs> where they had to put that down. Um, but uh, what's important is the witchcraft laws were a way of enacting kingly power and queenly power under Elizabeth, under Elizabeth for the first. This didn't stop the monarchy from trying to use magic itself. Um, it's not going. We're not going to cover it in this presentation. But of course, uh, Elizabeth the first had John Dee, who was a famous court magician, under her um, counsel, and also Edward Kelly who was an alchemist and worked with John Dee to try to turn lead and base metals into gold. So it was okay for the, the, the king and queen to use as long as uh, it was only them. The witch laws were eventually repealed in 1951. So they stayed on the books, George's stayed on the books. And in 1951, the, laws, uh, the witch laws of King George were repealed. And it was actually replaced with the Fraudulent Mediums Act. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that um, although there were magical practices happening before then, um, Wicca as a religion really didn't start. Uh, the first book was published in 1954 by Gerald Gardner, Witchcraft of Today. So you see the emergence and popularization of Wicca uh, three years after the witchcraft laws in England are repealed. Um, so as we all know, this, uh, this event, these uh, trials had a great impact in history, but sometimes those impacts, especially in terms of convictions and executions have been exaggerated. Um, during the period of uh, persecution in England, um, no more than 2000 people were tried and only a quarter of those were convicted, which is still a sobering number, but it isn't quite the exact, the exaggerated number that some people have thrown out. So um, I suppose we can, uh, I'll, I see there's some questions and comments in the chat, but I'm gonna let Kathleen take over to share with you what uh, Henry VIII was a little bit more concerned about when he, since he what clearly wasn't thinking that much about witchcraft. So Kath, my understanding is we purchased this book to support um, instruction in a course about witchcraft and um, you were delighted to find uh, some other, uh, other acts that you found interesting and want to share. Is, is I was delighted. Case? That's a good okay. way to put it. I was delighted. Yes. And um, 
<laughs> because we did all the way, you know, a lot of times we'll buy something for one reason, but then when we get it, we realize it can be used in all kinds of different ways. And that was certainly the truth with this book. So when we looked at it, it and what really kind of keyed us off is what Bethann said is when we had this little note with it and it, it had this whole, um, uh, Mr. Diamond, you know, as a previous owner, and the reason why he kept it was because of the lunacy laws. So that's what we kind of wanted to look at and kind of discover. And kind of being a Tudor history nut myself, I was really excited to delve more into this book. And when you go through it, Stacy mentioned there's a lot of acts about gaming. So you've got to remember that this started, this, this book began with acts um, at the beginning of Henry VIII's reign um, when he was, you know, one of the Renaissance princes of the time. Um, and it was, you know, 1509 and everything was fresh and new. And it would end in 1547 at his death when he was a bloated, unhappy man who had been through six wives. So it's, it's really interesting. So not only with gaming, but it also has really um, practical acts like no, you know, don't take valuables out of the country. Um, it had acts about pirates of the pirates of the and robbers of the sea. Um, there was a lot of problems apparently with whales. They had to deal with that a lot of, of time. Um, you know, whether you can't export raw wool. So a lot of it was practical things like that. But then as he became older, more and more acts were inserted that had to do specifically with him personally. And we would and we would definitely see that. So what what do we see? Well, about the time, about 1540s, the old king, the kind of the young prince of the realm was not, um, was not, was no longer. He was more looking like this guy you see to the left. He was fat, he was bloated. This is a good picture. This is a, a good representation. He had an open sore on his leg that would not heal, um, that smelled a lot. I mean, he was in bad shape but he was still up for romance. Um, so even though he was married to Queen um, Anne of Cleves, who he was not crazy about, he, his eye set on one of her ladies in waiting, which was Catherine Howard. Um, and that's who you see to the right. She was 17 at the time and, um, and quite beautiful. Matter of fact, he called her his rose without thorns, but sadly she had thorns. Um, she had, it was found that she had been particularly promiscuous before and after her marriage, which didn't settle well with him. So if you see to the right, these are different images that have survived that they're thought to maybe be of, of um, Catherine Howard. Um, it's, yes, midlife crisis run him up. Absolutely, Stacy. And he, um, but I mean, it basically, when he when you had a falling out with him, he got rid of, you were dead to him, he got rid of all your images. So these are only perspective images of what she looked like. So she was basically jailed and put to death without a trial. And he instead, he, act, he um, enacted a bill of attainder. So what happened and how is it reflected in this book? So it, all, it has, part of it has to do with both Catherine um, Howard, I'm choosing this drawing to the right, which I uh, like to think she looked like, and so would they Jane Parker. Now, Jane Parker, if you have watched any shows like The Tudors, maybe even Wolf Hall, if you've read any, even historical fiction, she always comes out um, as the villain of the whole Anne Boleyn trial, because she was married to Anne Boleyn's brother, George. George was accused of, um, of incest with his sister Anne Boleyn, one of several men, and they were all put to death. It is thought that Jane Parker, which you see the representation of, of her here, may be Jane, sometimes that people think it may be her sister, but they think it was her that gave damning evidence somehow to one of the real you know, reasons why Anne and George were both beheaded. So she was kind of a villain. And, um, but she, she would survive the whole Anne Boleyn scandal. She would later become queen and waiting to Henry's next two queens, um, including this young queen, Catherine Howard. So what was happening was, how, how did she get involved? Well, um, as I said, poor Catherine did have a young wandering eye. 
And she really thought as long as she kind of took care of the queen, the king, um, she, he could, she could have fun on her own. And that's just not what happened. So it turned out Jane Parker, Lady Rochford, was acting as a go-between between between Queen Catherine and um, other men, specifically a guy named Thomas Culpepper, and she was, and they were caught. So um, King Ca Queen Catherine and Jane were both arrested, and shortly after, Jane went stark raving mad. Now, that was pretty coincidental in time. People were like, yeah, you were fine before you were arrested, and now you're mad. Why was this important? Because at the time, you could not put to death anybody who was crazy, either before they were arrested or after they were convicted. That was a big no-no. Yes, the quickie defense. So, so, so that was one of the reasons why it's thought, yeah, convenient time to go mad. So the king actually, King Henry VIII actually sent his doctors over there to, to test her out. And they came back saying, yeah, she's crazy as a loon. So, um, so basically what was going to happen for him to put away these two women and her accomplices? Well, they had to enact several bills. Um, so the first thing was they, King Henry drew up an act, Act 20 of this document, in this book of this year, that said that it was okay to put to, to death um, people who were crazy. Either if they were crazy before or after, it didn't matter. It was all free game now. Then he enacted, which was Act 21, the act directly after that, a bill of attainder. So what is attainder? That means that anybody that has an attainder on them loses all land and civil rights completely. And this is usually suffered as a consequence of treason. And this is also effective because it means that all your heirs, all your family, basically it is all taken away. So this is a real, this is a real specific act. So the bill of attainder is related to Catherine Howard of late the queen, okay, and diverse other persons, okay. So this is Thomas Culpepper, who she was freak, who she was currently having an affair with, Fran, Francis Derham, who they dug up from her past, and Jane Berlin, Lady Rochford. And then, if that wasn't good enough, he also enacted the Royal Assent by Commission Act of 1541, which allowed um, anyone who was specifically these women convicted of high treason to be put to death without a trial. So this is for Beth Ann. Beth Ann wanted a update. Uh, Beth Ann wanted a cheat sheet on exactly who 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 come and gone in um, King Henry the Eighth stable. So we found yeah, Beth Ann has no idea what has ever happened in England. So and so we thought we would put this up because this was a fun cheat sheet about about where these folks stand. So original original um, wife Catherine of Aragon, who was Spanish. Um, she, they were married for 20 plus years and then he divorced her. She's my patron saint. Um, so basically divorces her to, because she has no male heirs. He, um, he marries Anne Boleyn, who you see the portrait to the right. Uh, they were to, to get a son. She did not have a living son. Of course, she birthed Queen, who was become Queen Elizabeth I. She was executed. Then the next is Jane Seymour. She was English. She didn't last about a year and a half or two years, but she gave him her, his son and dialed it, died in childbirth. Then for political reasons, he marries Anne of Cleves um, um, to get help. It was kind of a political help. Uh, later on, he decided he didn't like her a bit. He thought that she kind of looked like a horse and, um, and he was not attracted to her. So about six months later, that's annulled. Um, they're separated and she becomes quote unquote, the king's sister. Um, then the next is this Catherine Howard, who we've talked about, who was 17 years old, very promiscuous, but gorgeous. Um, he finds out that she's been cheating and puts her to death. And then finally, the only one to survive him, Catherine Parr, who would nurse him in old age. So that's kind of the cheat sheet to Henry. So back to the acts. So basically, he the trees that he who, he revises the Treason Act and makes a new Treason Act of 1541, providing that you can um, you have to you can basically can, um, try and convict a lunatic for high treason. This means it has to go to trial. Okay, that you can take them to trial. The next act just basically says um, again that you can that 
you know, it doesn't matter if they even fall into madness afterwards. And um, section two said, if they've, um, again, if they've already been tried and convicted before they turned insane, it, they could still be executed. This act was re reversed um, in 1554 under his daughter, Mary the first. There you see it down there. Okay, so both um, ladies are, are installed in the Tower of London, and you see that to the left. They are put there, uh, that's what, again, Jane is, has gone crazy. They have both basically, um, if not witnessed, understood that the other accomplices were put to death. Um, the, um, let's see, the uh, Thomas Culpepper, because he was a close friend of the king, he ends up um, being beheaded. Francis Durham, the one in the past, does not fare so well. He is drawn and quartered, one of the worst deaths that you can have in uh, Tudor England. Um, they are both, both women are beheaded on February 13th, 1542 on Tower Green within the Tower of London. And there is the block right there. They are very small, so they are dispatched with quick ax for both, quick one ax chop for both of them. Um, both of them, quote unquote, went to went to a good death in the sense that they got up there, they got a hold of themselves, they told everybody to support the king, and then they died. They were buried shortly after in the church that's within the compound of the Tower of London, which is St. Peter's Avenicular. You see that to the right in unmarked graves. And that is the end of both women. So it was really exciting to get that extra bit of history within a book that we originally bought for witchcraft. And so not only can we use it for that class, but we can also use it for um, English history classes too, which we teach. So that is the sad cautionary tale of women in the Tudor period that cheated on Henry VIII and their accomplices. And Kathleen inexplicably loves this history. So uh... <laughs> it's fun. Well, there's, it's so fun because there's so many books out on Tudor history and sh television shows. And um, it just always seems to be popular. But I tell you what, you have never seen a show that is as, to me, interesting or engaging as the real history. I've been channeling all of my rage about recent political events in uh, judicial uh, decisions to King Henry VIII. So I hope he doesn't show up today because I will not be very nice to him. So, um, so well, thank you. Does anyone have any other questions? We do have uh, some people sort of catching us up on English history and and the, yes, and the- And um, how smelly he was. <laughs> yeah, he was very smelly. And um, he was so heavy at the end, they had to literally, he, there's a few times he got into armor and they had, they had this device that actually was like a pulley system that would hoist him up and put him on his horse. Wow. And he was, always, he, was in a, he was pretty much in pain all the time and um, in, a, in a bad mood. But thank you for um, people in the, in the chat that put a kind of the succession um, after he died up. Um, he did have one surviving son with um, Jane Seymour. He was the next one, then Mary, uh, then, um, then actually you're right. I think Carolyn mentioned Lady Jane Grey, nine days queen, then Mary the first, then Elizabeth the first who, um, who reigned a long time and is considered one of the best uh, queens and monarchs that England never had. Hooray. Well, thank you very much. Um, we're all feeling bad for King Henry VIII's horse. So this is interesting. There's also um, other acts that you can want to research that the whole gaming act or it is actually required all men to practice archery and ban the games which were seen as distracting from archery. So no Xbox, no, you know, poker, things like that. So pip pip and all that. Yes, thank you, Scott. I think that's a good way to end it. So thank you and we will see you all at our next first Friday. Thank y'all for coming. <laughs>